thank you for the opportunity to be able to present our work at this meeting today. Um, ethically, finding alternatives for potency testing has been a great challenge for us. And I'll go through our data. Um, Securus, CSL Securus has been developing antivenoms for Australia and parts of the rest of the world since the 1930s. And this is a uh, table of what we have developed over the, uh, this period of time. Australia has one of the greatest um, number of venomous creatures. And so to, in order to uh, be able to protect our communities, we have been actively developing these antivenoms for uh, many decades. We manufacture this and it largely is unchanged since the development by Calmet. Uh, the, the venom is obtained by milking snakes and spiders and other venomous creatures. Um, it is injected into animals such as a horse or rabbits, depending on the venom that we're doing. Uh, the blood is then collected, the antibodies are purified and concentrated uh, in a GMP environment. And then we uh, have to determine its potency so that we can adequately provide uh, protection to a, a human that has been envenomated. The complexity of venoms are probably very familiar to this audience and just as a way of introduction, uh, this is the different organs that are affected by snake venoms. And so therefore, if you want to understand the potency of a particular antivenom, it needs to deal with a, a large range of different molecules, whether they be uh, neurotoxins, uh, cardiovascular toxins, coagulation toxins, et cetera. As another way of illustrating this, this is on the left-hand side, an SDS page uh, um, analysis of a range of uh, Australian snake venoms, and then a Western blot where we use brown snake venom. And you can see in uh, where I'm indicating with my cursor, how the brown snake really lights up, but we get some cross-reactivity with some of the other uh, snake venoms as well. And so we have a, a large diversity of yep. proteins and, and toxins that are present. Um, and therefore an antivenom has to be able to neutralize the active components within this particular, these particular uh, uh, strains. And so, sorry, I'm excuse just getting a bit. Excuse me, can, can you start from the beginning because here it was an interruption and we just got the connection. So you will have the whole, the full 20 minutes again. No problem. Oh, okay. okay. So, thank no you. No problem. No problem. So thanks very much for inviting me to present our work on an alternative uh, potency uh, testing for antivenoms. Um, Securus CSL has been making Australian antivenoms since the 1930s. Uh, this is not a new technology. It's been around for many decades. Australia is um, uh, home to many different snakes that are venomous, seven uh, particular snakes that are venomous that are listed here. Uh, we have two spider, uh, and venomous, venomous spiders, uh, stonefish, jellyfish, and all of these we have created antivenoms. And these have been active, uh, actively used in hospitals and around Australia for many decades preventing the envenomation of individuals or rescuing envenomated people. Um, we generate these antivenoms in a very um, uh, typical fashion. It's largely unchanged since Calmet uh, developed antivenoms in France uh, in the 1890s. These venoms are, the venom is obtained by milking snakes or spiders or other venomous creatures uh, like uh, jellyfish. We take that venom and we inject it into uh, animals. Uh, we use horses. Uh, the reason being is that they are very large animals and therefore we can uh, generate a large amount of plasma from th those animals. But in some cases, we uh, go into uh, rabbits uh, and smaller animals because of the amount of venom that we can obtain from the different uh, collection. Following envenomation, uh, the blood is collected from those animals. The antibodies are purified by very standard techniques then concentrated and dispensed into vials ready for clinical use. And so we must be, as part of this GMP process, we must de determine the potency of the antivenom so that we can adequately uh, control what is delivered to a human in the cases of envenomation. Venoms, which are, are very complex mixtures of uh, toxins, 
This would not be unfamiliar to this audience, and I won't go into great detail about this, just as a way of um, illustrating this. I've got uh, several, several slides where you can see the action of snake venom on different body systems where the venoms can uh, attack uh, through ne their neurotoxins, though myotoxins or cardiovascular toxins, coagulation uh, uh, points as well. And so therefore, a, an anti-venom has to be able to deal with all these different components. And so therefore, it's not a simple task to ensure that what you are um, testing for potency is that it actually covers these different areas. And so to further illustrate that, on the left-hand side is an SDS page analysis of uh, the six of the uh, snakes that are found in Australia. And you can see that the protein profile of these snakes differ by the, the laddering of the different uh, proteins that are present. Uh, and on the right-hand side is when we blot or uh, probe that SDS page with a brown snake venom. You can see the brown snake venom lights up very strongly. This has been indicated by my cursor now, but you also see cross reactivity with some of these other uh, snake venoms. What this is illustrating is how complex this, uh, these toxins or collections of toxins are. If we just as a further way of illustrating that, if we go through the different uh, venoms that we concentrate on in Australia and, um, and the antivenoms that are there, you can see that we have a diverse range of neurotoxins, pore forming toxins, cardiotoxins, myotoxins, and pro and anticoagulants present. And so therefore, if we've got a trying to do a potency assay, we need to try and uh, have a system that will be able to deal with all these diverse toxins from a range of different species. And so this is quite problematic. If you start to think about the uh, 11 antivenoms that, that CSL Securus produces uh, to combat these um, various different creatures, and the different functionality of the, of the toxins present, you start to get to about 100, more than 100 different assays. We can't use immunological assays. It, the regulators require us to do, use functional assays. And so it would be overwhelming to do, develop over 100 different functional assays to be able to understand the potency that we are, um, of the antivenom that we're producing. In our uh, systems, we raise the, uh, this table illustrates uh, what animals uh, receive the venom and to, to generate that antivenom and what model is used to, um, to be able to test that uh, antivenom. This is the traditional way of actually testing the antivenom for potency. We, for example, with uh, death adder, we use horses to envenomate. We collect that antiser as the antivenom, and then we mix the venom and antivenom in guinea pigs of a certain weight. We give this subcutaneously to understand whether uh, and that uh, whether that uh, antivenom is active or not. So the other aspect of this is we um, for these um, different antivenoms we produce for these different species. We have different models. In other words, we've got guinea pigs, suckling mice, and and um, elderly mice. To be, and uh, to be able to test the different uh, antivenoms and they're given in uh, different routes. And so it, it took us some time to think about what we could do in an ethically um, appropriate way to generate an alternative potency asset. And so it led us to the question, um, and this is uh, just a detailed description of the three R principles of replacement reduction and refinement. And so can we develop a more ethical asset? And the, the key question for us is, if we can't use animals, but we need to use um, an organism that displays um, neurological pathways, uh, cardiovascular uh, systems, coagulation systems as well, we need to have some sort of organism, but it's not a necessarily defined as an animal. And the way we did that was we went into um, and examined the embryonated egg model. If embryonated eggs are, um, have a gestation period of 23 days, and currently uh, in various different jurisdictions, um, animals are not, cons uh, cons organisms are only considered to be animals once they have passed the 50% gestation age. And so in other words, if we did our 
analysis prior to day 10 and a half, we would, be ha would have the ability to be able to utilize a non-animal model for um, testing potency in eggs. And so we did this in various different ways. We injected from the top, but eventually we realized that a sideways injection was the best way to do it. We start our uh, injection on day six. Um, it's, as I said, it's a sideways uh, injection through the coroallantoic membrane. Uh, we then develop, determine the viability of the embryos after day 10, so prior to the 50% gestation age. And after that, we euthanize these embryos um, early on day 10 to ensure that they, uh, there is no further development. So these uh, eggs do not become animals uh, going forward. The neural system is not sufficiently developed at this stage um, is our understanding. And so these embryos do not experience any pain. And so these embryos are considered insensate. So this uh, um, picture illustrates four different types of eggs um, to be able to give you an understanding about the reading the readout of uh, this assay. So this is on day 10. If you look at the, this uh, egg on the left, it's being candled. You can see that there is a vasculature being developed. You can see the embryo here. This is considered to be a viable egg. If you don't see this complexity of development, and it's very easy to train people on how to determine viable versus non-viable, you can see in this egg, the circuitry system is not developed. There is no embryo here. It is actually, um, uh, uh, hasn't uh, developed at all. If we introduce a venom into these eggs, you can see an incredibly stark contrast, which is a non, again, a not viable egg at this point. The embryo has actually um, uh, had its coagulation system disrupted and therefore we can easily visualize this. If you haven't, these are all fertile eggs that we are uh, talking about here. If it is not fertile, you, again, you see this uh, infertile uh, um, egg. And so it is very easy to uh, delineate between a viable uh, egg that has not been affected by a venom or if you have a venom anti-venom mixture, uh, it's been neutralized versus one where the venom is active. And so from utilizing embryonated eggs, we can determine um, what the standard, this is using standard terminology, the 50% lethal dose. And so lethal is a, is a problematic term here, or we can say viable dose. Uh, so by titrating your venom into eggs, you can do a ED50, which is the 50% effective dose of the anti-venom potency. And so that's titrating the anti-venom against a constant venom test dose. And therefore you can then determine the anti-venom potency. We've done a, a great deal of optimization of this assay with um, dose ranges of venom and anti-venom and optimizing the, the venom lethal dose in um, um, day five and day six eggs. Um, and the number of eggs we use per dose is six eggs. So we can increase the number of uh, eggs we use compared to what happens with animals. And so therefore it's a much more statistically powerful way to do this work. Uh, we incubate the venom and anti-venom at 30 minutes on ice. We use a uh, BSA or protein uh, diluent to maintain the venom potency. And then we can correlate uh, this assay with the potency in animals to ensure that what we are finding is consistent what we've previously find, found over many decades of doing this work. And so this is some data that we produced on the left-hand side is venom potency. Uh, we use Taipan venom as our model for uh, optimizing this system. You could, we looked at three different lots of venom and you can see uh, on four, time, four experiments with this lot, 26 times with this lot and five times with this lot, how consistent the, uh, these, the venom potency reads out for the LD50 um, in uh, this assay. Um, and then if we uh, do a ED50 where we're measuring uh, the, um, a consistent venom dose and then titrating in the anti-venom, you can see again, we see a very consistent uh, response. It starts, the variation uh, actually increases as we increase the venom test dose here, not surprisingly. And so if we then look at the, a guinea pig or animal potency assay done three times, uh, and the um, ED50 of the embryonated egg, we see a very um, uh, rewarding uh, linear response. And so 
uh, the slope of these correlate uh, quite uh, well. And so we know that the assay variability is very limited in this. And so that we are quite pleased that we get a linear response to the standard uh, guinea pig potency for this particular bet. And so then the next question we asked ourselves was how applicable is this uh, to other uh, venoms? It looked extremely good in, with Taipan. And so what this uh, graph shows you is that the red is the embryonated egg model and testing uh, for potency. And the colors are the different uh, models for the different specific uh, venoms that we have tested. There is some variability. It's not a direct correlation with the um, uh, with every venom we see. But the most important um, finding here was that in each case, we had a readout and that the um, uh, venom, anti-venom uh, would read out in all the different uh, systems. Uh, the absence at the moment is for this in this graph, but we've done this more recently is red back spider venom. And we have a, a, a result which has just not been updated on this, on this graph. But essentially, it goes through all the snakes, two spiders, box jellyfish and stonefish. So it is going from land and sea snakes to um, um, aquatic creatures and spiders um, as well. And so we think that this is a universal approach to um, for um, medically relevant venoms um, and to replace the current system of using animals. So we are currently have also gone through a range of other um, non-Australian uh, venoms. We've looked at uh, different cobras, rattlesnakes, Russell uh, viper and saw scale viper, and we get an LV50. In other words, the uh, venom is active in this system. We're going to test another whole range of other venoms. Uh, this is in process at the moment, just to see the, the breadth of this model for other researchers that we obviously are not interested in doing this ourselves because we're only interested in Australian medically important venoms. And then we've also gone into looking at the purified toxins, prothrombin activators, myotoxins, neurotoxins um, uh, specifically. And again, these all read out in our system. And so the only one that we have yet to find um, active in our system is a three finger toxin, but we think this is this may need um, an accessory or chaperone molecule. And we're working on that at the moment to determine that. And we would um, happily take advice about this, but that's been our experience so far. So we've published this data, um, the articles in toxins, it's the articles called potency testing of venoms. The first author is Erin Verity. Um, we are very happy to share our um, procedures to enable other researchers to adopt this so that they can move away from using animals models. I think we've illustrated here that uh, we have done, um, demonstrated that this is a viable approach. And it just goes, um, and I'll conclude there just to thank all the people that did this work, work, Kathy Stewart, Erin Verity, the first author of that publication, Kirsten Vandenberg, these are three people that did the majority of the work um, and the data that I've presented today. And we've had great advice from Tim Jackson from the Australian Venom Research Unit. And I'll be very happy to answer questions. And I think I did that in about 15 minutes for you. I do have a talk here on the chat. It says, how confident are you to use an antivenom in humans that has been developed by only being used in the chicken embryonic model and not in other animals? And so, um, as I said, what we are doing is we're, we are correlating, like I showed with the Taipan, the uh, existing animal model with our chicken model. To date, we are very confident that this will be a way to go forward. We are doing this in consultation with the uh, regulator in Australia, which is the Therapeutic Goods Administrator, the TGA, and we would not go forward unless they gave us um, an appropriate um, indication that they were confident that what we were doing was appropriate. Uh, okay, I think someone's asked pretty much the question I was about to ask, so I won't bother asking it. Sure. Do we have a question? 
Yeah. Hi, Steve. It's David Williams from WHO. I'm just wondering do, what plans you might have for validation with other, say, national control laboratories to, to you know, actually test this in different um, working environments to see just how comparable the results are. We'd be very, we've got no immediate plans to do that, David. Um, I would be welcome a collaboration. We would um, bring either people into um, our laboratories or we could uh, guide people on how we are doing this, um, you know, the uh, how we have a sideways introduction of the venom. And so we are very open to having to, to doing exactly the work you are mentioning. I have also a question. What about the false negative and false positives that you find in your assays? I don't think, as I said, with a viable um, egg um, situation, we have an occasional uh, egg that actually um, succumbs to uh, bacterial contamination. That um, because we do six eggs per group um, and we titrate in, we, there is a very high statistical power to avoid false positives and false negatives. No, I, I mean more from the from the venom. When you inject the venom, there is a, a stress in the, in the in the egg. So, what happens if you inject a taxon specific venom that is not lethal for for the chicken but could be lethal for other animals it's just by injecting the venom that you see an effect it would be a false negative false uh, positive yeah we as i said we correlate all our work with the current animal models so we haven't seen that yet um all our venoms are you know like they read out very uh, easily, and but of course we have an anti-venom mixture titrated in as well, um, and so therefore uh, we can neutralise the venom. And so if that is not happening, then uh, we know that we are getting, as you say, a false positive. But we do not do not experience that. Okay. Okay. One more question, Steve. It's David again. Just on sure. that question about the three finger toxins, um, I don't know a great deal about the the development of the neuromuscular junction in chicken embryos, is it sufficiently developed at six days for those three finger toxins actually to have a binding site that they could interact with? Yeah, look, I think, I think that the three finger toxin is um, a really, um, a bit of a dilemma for us. Um, but if you, you know, I'd, we haven't answered. We think actually that there, um, it requires the three finger toxins. I, I think the, the embryo is developed enough um, certainly we've got muscular development that we can observe if we, you know, dissect out the embryo. Um, the, um, so we think that it's because the three finger toxins require a chaperone, right? And that's present in toxins. So when we take a purified three finger toxin, um, we can't, uh, show activity, but when we, um, what we're currently doing is dosing uh, the three finger toxin into other vet unrelated venoms to see and titrating those venoms down so that they are just on the borderline of activity and then seeing by spiking in the three finger toxin in an acting venom, whether we uh, can read out above the venom itself at that dilution. Does that make sense? So um, that's what we're currently doing. So we think that we need other components to actually make them active rather than the embryo itself being sufficiently developed. But that's still work in progress and we'll publish that. Well, I, I, I didn't hear from chaperones and acting on three finger toxins. So it could be a, a possibility just to isolate the toxin, the, the particular three finger toxin and the using in the, in the usual rodent model to see if it is acting or not. Sure, we have purified three finger toxins and that's what we're saying is that it's the one purified toxin we haven't been able to um, show activity yet and we um, don't know if that's a um, quality of the way we've purified it or the supplied, uh, the way that the supplier has purified it, we've done both. Um, and um, so, as I said, this is a dilemma for us at the moment, but it's a minor dilemma. Three finger toxin is only one of the, one of the toxins that are present. Um, 
we, you know, we are more focused on showing complete neutralization of the, just because we we can't find this in a purified three finger toxin doesn't mean we, we aren't reading out on it. It's just that we would like to read out on all, all the notable uh, components of complex venoms. But they, the, these venoms are very, you know, have a large range of different toxins. And so therefore we can't identify all, you know, absolutely every one of them. Okay, so if, any further question? If this is not the case, I look forward to follow up this, this issue in, in the future. And thank you again for your presentation. Thanks very much.